Well, good morning again, church. Good morning. It is a blessed day to be in the house of the Lord today. And today we journey back to rejoin our study in 1 Peter. We had stepped away for a couple of weeks for our um, Pentecost Sunday topical sermon and then our sermon last week in uh, Memorial Day. Today we're back in 1 Peter. When we were last in our study, Peter had closed out chapter 3 by reminding his hearers that Christ also suffered, meaning that we have a Messiah, we have a God who can intimately relate to our sufferings. So if, you've ever, if you have ever asked the question, what does God possibly know about my suffering? Peter reminds us that Christ also suffered. And he did so once for sins. It was a once for all time payment. It was a, a legal transaction that took place in eternity. It was in the heavenly realm that Jesus, who is God the Son, entered God the Father's courtroom to offer himself as the payment to redeem you and me from the wrath of God. Where once we sat on death row with no hope of parole, Christ himself, Christ Jesus, stepped in and he took our place. In other words, you're free to go. Your debt to the Father has now been paid. But not only did this transaction take place in the spiritual realm, but Peter wants us to understand, he wants us to know for certain that Jesus was a flesh and blood human being. He was truly God, yes, and at the same time, he was truly man. For Peter writes that Christ was put to death in the flesh. Though he was truly God, Jesus Christ was also truly man so that he could truly represent you and me as our substitutionary atonement. He really lived. Jesus really died. He was put to death by the very ones that he had come to save. And his brutal death on that Roman cross, it, it proved his humanity, that yes, he was a man. Because remember, there was, back in the day, there was this Gnostic belief that Jesus was just spirit. He wasn't really, he wasn't really human. He wasn't really a flesh and blood man because the Gnostic teaching of the day, the great Greek philosophy that was going on or teaching of the day, this docetism was that flesh was evil, and therefore since Christ had no evil in him, he was good. He couldn't possibly have been a man. And so again, Peter wants us to know he was put to death in the flesh. He was truly a man. And so his death on that Roman cross proved, yes, he was human. But his resurrection proved that he was divinity. He was his divinity proved that he was divine. He was truly God as well. Peter writes, he was made alive by the Spirit. Jesus proclaimed in John chapter 10 that he alone had the power to lay down his life and he also had the power to pick it back up again. That's in John 10 verses 17 to 18. And then on the third day after his crucifixion, he proved that what he said was true. Amen? He resurrected. But before the resurrection... During those three days, Christ went to the place of the dead, Scripture says. We just read that in 1 Peter. He went to the place of the dead. He showed himself as the long-awaited Messiah. He, had, he showed himself as the Savior of the world. And he showed himself to those who had died, anxiously looking forward to the coming of the Christ. In other words, they were looking for the Messiah. They were looking for the Christ. But they died. They died believing. And so then Christ, when he died on the cross for three days, it said that he descended. He went to the place of the dead, down to Sheol. And he presented himself. I'm him. I'm the one that you've been looking for. And church, this proved that God does not forget us. Not even in death does God forget God had remembered those who were righteous, those who had faithfully worshipped Yahweh, the one true God. He remembered them. And it says that God is faithful. Jesus descended into Sheol, into Hades, it's written in Greek, place of the dead, to bring hope to them and to rescue those who were awaiting him. But Peter also revealed that Jesus at the same time Remember how Jesus had talked about the rich man of Lazarus, that as, as, as Lazarus descended into the bosom of Abraham, into paradise, 
that at the same time, the rich man could see him, and the rich man was in torment, but there was a great gulf between them, so they couldn't get back and forth, but they could see each other, they could talk to each other, and they could hear each other. So as Jesus is revealing himself as the Messiah and bringing hope and rescue to those who are righteous, at the same time, those on the other side of the gulf, those are the, the ones who are, in, who are in torment, they could see him as well. And he looked across that great gulf, which had separated paradise and a place of torment, and he showed himself to those who were rebels, to those who had lived a life of wickedness. And Scripture goes on to say also that he showed himself to the angels who had sinned and that were chained in the pit. So the revelation that was coming did not bring hope to them, but it brought upon them everlasting shame and judgment. They had died in their sins. They lived their lives rejecting God, rejecting a call to holiness. And now their hope was eternally lost at seeing the coming of the Messiah. There was no hope now. Only the final judgment remains. And from here, Peter then brings a correlation in this chapter 3 of the Ark of Noah and of Christ. Remember, Noah's Ark it was a refuge from the wrath and the judgment of God. That's what it was. It was their refuge. It was their only hope of survival. Because God's wrath and judgment was get, about to come upon a sinful, God-hating world. And their only hope was the ark. There was only one door. There was only one way onto the ark of safety. Just one way. And any who entered by it would be saved. But sadly, Scripture tells us and records that there were only eight who were faithful. Only eight believed. Noah and his immediate family. That was it. His three sons, their wives, and his wife. That was it. Noah and his immediate family were saved. They believed God. But not only did they believed God, they were obedient to his call. They were obedient to his warning. And Peter writes that God, that, that God, the divine, was long-suffering, he says. He was long-suffering. He was patient. God was patient while Noah faithfully and dutifully, he built that ark. Scripture tells us and records in the book of Genesis, for 120 years, God patiently endured sinful man's rebellion and wickedness. And it, it begs the question, hey, Lord, how much more patient are you going to be with wicked and sinful humanity today? I mean, it's a testimony. When we look out as Christians upon our nation, upon the world, upon the entertainment industry, wherever you want to look, all you see is wickedness and perversion. And we think, Lord, what a testimony of your patience. That's what it is. 2 Peter 2.5 reveals that Noah was called a preacher of righteousness. Noah was obedient to God as he constructed the ark. And no doubt, as people would come up to him, you know they would, and they'd ask, Noah, what are you doing? Why are you building this great big boat? I mean, at this time, Scripture had, had recorded that it really had never rained on the earth. God went to, to water the plants and the trees and the, and the fruit and the vegetables and all these things. He said a mist came up from the ground. It had not rained. They didn't know what that was. So they're going, what are you doing? Why are you building this great, big, huge boat? And the people that are asking Noah this, now remember, these would have been family. These were friends, aunts, uncles, cousins, brothers, sisters. He's got all these people. And they're asking him, well, Noah, what are you doing? And Noah, it says again in 2 Peter 2, 5, he's a preacher of righteousness. So no doubt Noah would have told him what God had said. That Noah would have warned them that God Almighty's wrath and judgment was coming. And though Scripture doesn't say that he was mocked and ridiculed, and Scripture doesn't say that, it's not too far a stretch to make that assumption, is it? I mean, think about today, as Christians today, we try to go out and we, we, we warn the world of Judgment Day that God is coming back. And what happens? We're mocked. We're ridiculed for that. So it's not too far a leap to think that the same thing was probably happening to Noah. There's nutty Noah building his big boats, been doing it for 120 years, sun's still out, weather's still beautiful. People are so distracted today. People are absorbed by their daily lives. They're absorbed and distracted by comfort and entertainment that they absolutely have no time and no desire for the things of the God of the Bible. I want to live my life how I want to live it on my terms. I want to be happy. 
You have no right to tell me that what I'm thinking and what I'm living is wrong, people will tell you. So they don't want anything to do with the God of the Bible. D.L. Moody, he once said this. He says, I have no doubt that those who would not pray when the ark was being built, they prayed when the flood came. He says, but their prayer was not answered. He says, I have no doubt that when Lot went out from Sodom, the city of Sodom cried to God. But it was too late. And God's judgment swept them from the earth. Moody writes, my friend, it is not too late now. But it may be at 12 o'clock tonight. He says, I cannot find any place in the Bible where it says that you may call tomorrow. Moody says, I am not justified in saying that. Behold, now, right now, this very minute is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation, is what the Bible actually says. Eight souls, Peter writes, were saved through the water. Only eight. Here, Peter connects, then next he connects baptism and the waters through which Noah and his family were saved. Now, Peter's not saying that water baptism saves you. He's not even saying that it contributes to your salvation. What he is saying is that it's a picture, it's an anti-type. It's an outward symbol and proclamation to the watching world that you have been saved. He says, it's not the water of baptism, but it's the internal baptism of the Holy Spirit which saves you. It's being born again by the Spirit of God. That's what saves you. Going under the water represents death and burial. And then as we come back up, it's a picture of our rebirth into new life. Our new life in Christ. And this new birth is only possible because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul explains that Christ was called the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. In other words, those who have died. He continues and he says, For since by man, it's a little m, that means Adam, for since by Adam came death by man, and this is with a capital M in your Bible, that's Jesus. By Jesus also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 to 22. In Christ's work on the cross, Christ's resurrection, that now opens the way to God for us. He is the door. And then 40 days after his resurrection, Christ ascended back up into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. And the good news is that today, Christ sits as our own high priest. He is our advocate. And Peter proclaims that all the angels, all the authorities, all the powers have been made subject to him. And then the Apostle Paul reveals in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 to 11, that God also has highly exalted him, highly exalted Jesus, and given Jesus the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus... Every knee should bow of those in heaven, of those on the earth. If you think about the people today that mock Jesus, they mock us as Christians. They mock the word of God. God's word says that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. But not only of those in heaven and those on the earth, Paul also writes of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Church, we, we worship and we serve an amazing God. Amen. I mean, he is an amazing Savior. And today, Peter now, he carries on this, this trail of thought that we've been on. He carries on this trail of thought to remind us of our great obligation as a born-again Christ follower. So if you have your Bibles... And you don't already have them open, please open your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 4. Be looking at the first six verses today of 1 Peter chapter 4. Once you've found 1 Peter chapter 4, I'll ask you to stand to honor the reading of God's holy word. Stand as you're able for 1 Peter chapter 4 verses 1 to 6. Starting at verse number 1 of 1 Peter chapter 4, it says, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. We, we walked in lewdness and lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. 
In regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. And for this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word today, that it is mighty and powerful, that your word is sharper than any two-edged sword. Father, we pray that your word and your spirit will have its way among us and in us today. May you teach us today. Father, help me to hide behind your cross that the words that I speak today not be my words, but your words. And may the seed of the gospel fall into good soil today. And Father God, may you be glorified in all that is said and done. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. So now here in 1 Peter chapter 4, the first two verses, Peter connects chapters 3 and 4 together. He's making a bridge. Remember, we, he says, therefore, anytime we read therefore in the scripture, we ask the question, what's the therefore? Therefore, everything we just talked about, that's that summary of what Peter's been talking about in those first three chapters, specifically that chapter 3, now he's making a connection. He's connecting these two chapters. We just read and heard and understood all that Christ being holy and perfect and innocent, all that he did for us. How he made us clean before the Father, taking on our sin debt, raising us to new life, preaching to the dead, opening the way to God. He did all that for you, and now Peter wants us to understand, he wants you to understand our part, our duty, what we need to do. He wants us to understand our obligation to Christ. Look again at 1 Peter 4, 1-2. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us, in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. Peter here, he's saying that if you're alive in Christ, in other words, if you're born again, then you're dead to sin. You are dead to sin. Your old you is dead and buried. Think again of the picture of baptism he was just painting for us. You go under the water, you're raised up to new life, dead to sin, and alive to God. The Apostle Paul goes into even more detail in Romans chapter 6. As a matter of fact, in this section of 1 Peter 4, you, if you take notes in your Bible, you should write down Romans 6, because these two connect together, and I'm going to show you that. Hold your place in 1 Peter, and let's turn to the book of Romans chapter 6. Book of Romans chapter 6. Amen when you're there, Romans 6. Amen. So we come to the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the book of Acts, then we come to the book of Romans, chapter 6. Paul writes, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we also shall live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. So what then? Shall we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, 
whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end to everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Church, our Christian life, your life in Christ is to be a life of sacrifice. We're to sacrifice. We, we sacrifice our old wants and our old desires. We actually crucify them to the cross of Christ. Look back again at 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 to 2. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin that he no longer live, should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. Two things I want to point out in these first two verses. Number one is this, and you can underline it, where he writes, arm yourselves, he says. As a Christian, we must arm ourselves daily with the full armor of God. We have to do that to be able to stand against our threefold enemy we talked about last week, the world, the flesh, and the devil. We fight and we go to war against temptations and the desire to sin. We have to do that. We fight against it. We go to war against it. This is the picture Peter is painting here where he writes, arm yourself. This is a serious deal when you, when you wake up every day. And it's because our daily walk, it's a battle. Amen. I mean, if you're not seeing that your walk is a battle, there's something really wrong there because we have a warring enemy. We have that threefold enemy. The, the world comes against us with all its temptations and the things that it says is the right thing to do and the right way to be. And then we have our own flesh that seeks to corrupt us and, and tries to draw us back into sin and temptation. And then we have the devil, like we talked about this morning uh, in our Bible study, looking for, at, at the book of Job. We have a very real enemy, the devil, who wants to bring sin and temptation. And so our, our daily walk is a battle. And if you really, really want to be victorious over sin and temptation, you must arm yourself with the full armor of God. You have to do it every day if you want to be victorious. So arm yourself. The second thing is where Peter writes, has ceased from sin. Now first we have to understand what this does not mean. As a born again Christian, you're still going to fall into the trap of sin. It's going to happen. You're going to, you're going to mess up. You're going to say the wrong thing. You're going to do or not do things that you should do or should not do. It's going to happen. This is not saying that you will never sin again. But what this is referring to is unrepentant, willful sin. In other words, I don't wake up first thing in the morning and go, man, I can't wait to get out of bed and sin today. I can't wait to get up today and look at pornography. I can't wait today to get up and, and just say horrible things to people and think horrible things and do this and watch this. I don't get up thinking that in the morning. So it's not, a, it's not a willful, unrepentant sin. That's not what this is talking about whenever it says this, cease from sin. And I want to show you what I mean. Hold your place in 1 Peter. We're going to go forward past 1 Peter, 2 Peter, into 1 John. So let's turn to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. You're in 1 Peter now. Go to 2 Peter. And then the next book after that is 1 John chapter 1. Amen when you're there. Amen. 1 John chapter 1, starting at verse number 8. Look what the apostle writes. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. 
and his word is not in us. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world, for those who would believe. So here's the question. Is it possible to never sin again? No, it's not. Not as long as we're trapped in these corrupt mortal bodies. Charles Spurgeon said this, and I read it this morning as our devotional. In every believer's heart, Spurgeon writes, in every believer's heart there is a constant struggle between the old nature and the new. If you're having a struggle today, that's normal. If there's no struggle in you between sin and righteousness, there's an issue there. Because Spurgeon writes again, every believer's heart, there's a constant struggle between the old nature and the new. The old nature is very active and loses no opportunity to wield all the weapons of its deadly armory against newborn grace. While on the other hand, the new nature is constantly watching to resist and destroy its enemy. Grace within us will employ prayer and faith, hope, and love to cast out the evil. It takes to it the full armor of God, and it wrestles earnestly. These two opposing natures will never cease to struggle so long as we are in this world. So it's going to happen. This holy Christian life, our walk with Christ, is a walk through a virtual minefield of sin and temptation. And again, I say minefield. Think about again today, 77 years ago, those brave men that were rushing onto the shores of Normandy and Omaha and all the different beaches, there were mines on the field. And some of them were hit by those mines. Some were killed. Some were maimed. In our Christian walk, we walk through a minefield. There's temptation here. There's sin here. It's the world, the flesh, and the enemy. It's very real. And our only hope for victory, our only hope, is to arm ourselves every day with the full armor of God. And guess what? God has already provided us with that armor. It's not something you have to pray for. God, is, if you're in Christ today, if you're born again, He's already provided it for you. He's given it to you. And so we, we arm ourselves every day. And then the other thing is to, to repent. Now, so many people today think repent means to say, I'm sorry. But that's not the definition of repentance. Repentance is to turn 180 degrees from who we once were and the things that we once did. It's a 180 degree turn. Church, you, you cannot live the life that Christ has called you to with one foot still in the world. It will be an anchor to you. Your foot still in the world is like it's planted here and you're trying to reach for Christ in that holy walk and you cannot do it because you'll be glued and you'll be stuck there. You have to dig your feet into the rock you have to dig your feet into that firm foundation and say, I will not be moved. I will not take one step backward to my former life. Because you know what? That former life is going to constantly be trying to pull you back. So you have to dig your feet in and say, I'm not going to do it. I've set my face against that way, and I'm going to keep moving forward. I'm going to plant my feet firmly into the rock. And when you do that, there will be consequences. You may lose some friends. You may even lose some family members in the process. They may say, if you're going to be that way, I can't be with you anymore. I can't hang out with you anymore. Look back at 1 Peter chapter 4. Peter addresses this. 1 Peter 4, verses 3 and 4, he says, For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and indomitable idolatries. In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. When you make that 180 degree turn in your life and in your walk, it should be so drastic, so foreign to people, that people should be able to see the new you. Something different about you. So much so, they may even mock you for it. They may even ridicule you for it. They may even get downright verb, uh, vulgar and nasty about the new you. You think you're better than me now? 
They may say these things, only not that pleasant. Now, I'm not saying that you should be arrogant. I'm not saying that you should be have a holier-than-thou attitude toward other people. But what I am saying is that the old you stands in stark contrast to the new you. In other words, whereas once you used to say profanity and curse words, now you don't. Whereas once you told dirty jokes and quote-unquote adult humor, now you don't. You may even tell somebody, I really don't even want to hear that. Whereas once you might have participated in gossip and slander, now you don't. Whereas once you'd go out and party and get drunk, now you don't. You don't do that anymore. Whereas once you couldn't wait to see this new movie or TV show, and it might be filled with profanity and sexual content and nudity, nudity and other worldly content, now you go, you know what? Just not going to watch that stuff anymore. You can't do it. And it's because you want to, you honestly want to set a guard on your eyes and your ears and on your heart and your mind. Because you understand. You understand as scripture teaches that a little leaven leavens the whole loaf. In other words, a little sin, a little sin here, a little, a little compromise there. It opens the door to greater and greater compromise and sin. Either you feed your heart and your mind with the truth and the things of God, the things that actually please God, and things that strengthen your spirit and strengthen your walk, or you feed your mind with things of the world. Things which the world seek and things that will choke out Things that will, that will seek to strangle your faith and even put a stumbling block in your path for you to trip and fall over. And you'll see it's either or. It can't be both. You have to make a choice. And so when you shun the things of the world, you shun the things of the flesh and the devil, the things that you used to love, the things that you used to participate in. People will turn against you. People will mock you. People, they might even persecute you. And Peter, Peter wants you to know this and he wants you to be prepared so that when it happens, you're not going to be taken off guard. You'll go, wow, what? this is like prophecy here. Peter said this would happen if I follow after Christ. And man, it's happening. He wants you to know about it. Be prepared. Maybe you say, the pastor, I don't want to lose my family members. I don't want to lose my friends. I understand that. And you know what? I, I have lost friends because of my faith. I have friends that we grew up together. We went to high school together. We were like this. I mean, thick as thieves, as they used to say. We were like brothers. And then when I, I, the Lord saved me and I tried to witness to them, I mean, they cussed me out. I had a friend say, if this is the path that you're going to be on, and you're going to be talking about Jesus all the time, then I can't be with you anymore. I said, sorry, man. I can't stop talking about Jesus. I love you. I want to see you saved. And then he cussed me and hung up and we hadn't talked in years. I've lost friends, I know, and I understand. I understand that that hurts because you genuinely care for these people. But you have to be willing to let them go. You have to be willing to let go of those who are a negative influence on you. If there's somebody that every time you get around them, they, you find yourself slipping back into the world and talking like they talk and acting like they talk, you got to kind of make that cut. You got to make that disconnection. You got to do it. Maybe that person's even become hostile to you. If the choice comes down to Jesus or this other person or people, you have to choose Jesus. And I want to show you that. Hold your place here. Look at Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. I don't want you to just take my word for it. But the first of the Gospels, Matthew chapter 10, starting at verse number 32. Amen. You want to see what Christ says about this. So, amen. Matthew chapter 10. Amen. Right. Starting in verse number 32 of Matthew chapter 10, Christ says, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I also will confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I didn't come to bring peace, 
but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those of his own household. For he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. For he who finds his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake will find it. Now that's not a, a message that the contemporary American Christian church preaches today, is it? They want to say, we just need to love everybody. Everybody's going to be saved and there is no hell and just, we're all just sitting around singing kumbaya together. But Jesus says, I came to bring a sword. I came to separate the false from the true, light from darkness. It's the serious stuff that we're dealing with. And so friends, the sacrifice that you make now, it will be worth it. Because look at 1 Peter again, chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. They, they will, speaking of those people now, that have been giving you a hard time, those people that have mocked you and ridiculed you, maybe have persecuted you. Because remember, Peter's writing to a persecuted church right now. He says, they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason the gospel is preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. Church judgment day is coming. I mean, it's coming. And for those who are in Christ, those of us who are in our ark of safety, we have nothing to fear. Did you know that if you're in Christ today, you have nothing to fear in Christ's second coming? You have nothing to fear on judgment day. And you have nothing to fear if we die before he comes back and we stand before him. We have nothing to fear if you're in the ark of refuge, if you're in Christ but for those who have rejected God and they cling to the world and things of the world, it's just a fearful and terrifying day that awaits them. They have no concept and no clue. And those who mocked you and they spoke evil of you and they even maybe even persecuted you, they will have to give an account before Almighty God for every idle word and every idle action. Nothing is hidden from God. He sees your faithfulness you still love them. You still pray for them. And I, and I hope you haven't misunderstood me when I say you have to make that disconnection. I'm not saying you just cut them off. I'm saying that, you know what? I can't go out and party with you. I can't watch these things with you. I can't participate in the things you want me to participate in. I love you. I want to be your friend. I want to be your family member. I want to be in your life. But if you're going to try and drag me down that path, I can't go down that path with you. But I love you and I will pray for you. That's the attitude that we have. But we just can't participate in that because you know what? It will drag you down. Because it's God who changes the hearts of people, of men and women. So nothing is hidden from God. He sees your faithfulness and He sees your sacrifice for Him. And you have His word that He will reward your faithfulness. And so you and I, we are to go, we're to preach the truth and love, but we're not only supposed to just talk the talk, but our walk has to match what we profess. We cannot be accused of hypocrisy. God doesn't want part-time Christians. You're either all in or you're all out. There's no middle ground. Now, are you going to be perfect? You're not going to be perfect in all you say and do. Only Christ is perfect. Are you going to always get it right and never stumble? No. But that's where repentance and grace comes in. Amen. God's grace can cover your stumbles, your mess-ups. But friends, we don't willfully sin or fall by thinking, you know what, well, I'm going to say this or do this, or I'm just going to do this this one time, because I know that God's going to forgive me. Friends, if we do this or say that or think that, that kind of thinking is sin. It's actually an insult to the grace of God. But if we do mess up, I sin, I didn't want to do it. Oh, why did I say that? Why did I do this? Why did I let myself watch that? I didn't want to do it. And we do that. Then we go to God and we cry out, God, forgive me, please. God sees your heart. He sees your intentions. 
cry out for forgiveness, being truly broken over our sin. Not a flippant, well, God forgives everybody. That's not the idea. But God, I am truly broken. I, I don't want to do that. I don't know why I did that. And we repent and we turn away from sin. And we make that determination, Lord, I don't ever want to go back there. I mean, remember the Hebrew word for repent. It has the Hebrew letters bet and shem in them. And those pictures, which the letters are, look like little pictures, they actually symbolize uh, a fire and a tent. And what that Hebrew word then for repentance symbolizes is burning down the house. In other words, this is the house that I used to live in. A house of sin and ill repute and all these things I used to like to do. But now I repent. I turn out. But now I, know I turn and walk away. I set fire to the house and I burn it down. So I've got nothing to go back to. That's a biblical definition of repentance. I burn the house down. I'm not even going back there. i got nothing to go back to. That's the biblical picture of repentance. And that's the kind that God wants from us. And afterward, after we, we sin, we mess up, we might have to go to the person and ask their forgiveness. Maybe you did slip up. Maybe you went and you watched a movie that you know you really shouldn't have that the Spirit was, uh, was convicting you about. Maybe you went to a bar. Maybe you did something that way. And so you go home, the Holy Spirit convicts you, and you cry out to God for forgiveness. Then you need to go to that person and go, you know what? I am so sorry. And they might go, what are you talking about? Man, I didn't represent Christ well to you. And I just, I would like to ask your forgiveness. Because I don't want you to think that I'm some kind of hypocrite. I'm really not. Man, I just stumbled. I messed up. And so I just ask you to forgive me. Um, and so I, I'll do better. I want to represent Christ well to you. And you know how powerful that would be to somebody to tell them that? I didn't represent Christ well to you. I'm sorry. I hope you can forgive me. That's powerful. But not only do we say it, then we need to live it. Church, Christ died for you. Now he wants you and I to go and live for him. And not only live for him, but live for the holy, set-apart life that he has called you to. And know that when you do that, no matter the cost, God will defend you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word that instructs us, that it guides us, a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Father God, when sin and temptation seeks to devour us and seeks to lead us off the path that you have put us on. Lord, drive us to your word. Let your spirit, Lord, just convict us daily of our sin and our need for you. Help us to walk in the victory that you've already, you've already paid for, Lord. You've given us the, the full armor of God that we can put on the moment that we wake up that we trust in you and your word and not our feelings and our emotions. We don't trust what the world says is right and wrong, but we trust in what you say is right and wrong. And so, Father, today we pray that you would strengthen our hearts, strengthen our minds through your spirit today and through your word, that we may go here as brave men and women, soldiers for Christ, that will stand strong in the truth, strong in our faith, and we may proclaim to a lost and a dark and a dying world that you are, Lord Jesus, the ark of salvation. And Father, we ask all of this in the mighty name of Jesus.